So good afternoon. Welcome to DevConf. As the big slide behind me says, my name is Elon Uranik, and I work at Synopsys, where I manage the development of the Node.js and .NET agents for Seeker. If you've never heard of Seeker or haven't heard about Seeker yet, Seeker is the best IAST product out there, but as fascinating as IAST is in particular and application security is in general, it's just not my topic today, so this is the last time I'm going to mention it. Instead, I want to talk about security. <coughs> so, bleh, that was a Freudian slip, of course, sorry. <laughs> Jitters, I want to talk about inclusion. But before I go into inclusion, I kind of have to address the elephant in the room. For, for those of you who know me and know my background as a DBA, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about Postgres database, don't worry. But the, the elephant in the room here is me, of course. So why is a privileged, straight, white dude up here talking about inclusion? <clears throat> well, I think the, the key here, first of all, is to recognize your privilege. And I'm fully aware of how privileged I am to, to be speaking here, how privileged I've been to, be in, to have been speaking here for the last seven years, I believe, how privileged I am to work for a great company like Synopsys, who was willing to fund my trip here, and all the privilege I had throughout the career, my career to, to get to this point. <clears throat> but the, <clears throat> the, the key for those of us who are privileged and recognize that they are privileged is to use this privilege and share it, to put it to good use, to help promote people who do not um, enjoy the same privilege. First of all, because that's the right thing to do, and if you do not use your own privilege like this, you're wasting it. And if for no other reason, privilege is a matter of context, and having privilege one day can just go away the next day. If you don't believe me, just ask my ancestors. <clears throat> okay, much less snark than I expected. So this is either not controversial or you're <laughs> still recovering from lunch. Okay, now, now everyone's awake, right? So why are we talking about inclusion in open source? As open source, by definition, is open, right? Anyone can send a patch, anyone can participate. Well, it's inclusive by nature, why are we even talking about it? I don't think this is always true. I think, I, I won't go as far as saying all open source, but in a lot of communities, there's a big difference between being able to send a patch, which anyone can do because it's open, and actually, <coughs> excuse me, actually being able to affect the community, actually being able to make decisions, actually being a part of it. And I'm, I'm, just to clarify, I don't mean the difference between maintainers and, or committers or whatever you call them and people that aren't. It is okay to have different privileges for different roles. It is okay to say these people have a proven track record, we trust them to commit stuff, and other people don't. The problem begins when you have different people with the same track record who enjoy different privileges. If that's the case, then you have an inclusion problem. <clears throat> the, the good news, at least from my experience, is is, sorry, that more often than not, this isn't done intentionally. Don't think <coughs> any of us set out to be exclusionary. But, but it does happen. And I think the reason it happens more often than not is that we just can't help ourselves being human. <coughs> Humans suffer from cognitive biases. But biases are these small, um, unconscious mental shortcuts our brains make to help us cope and process the world around us. Now, I'm sure some of you are like sitting there and thinking, wow, 
that sounds awful. I'm, I really feel sorry for, for people who have these. How, how lucky am I not to have these, right? So welcome to the world of unconscious bias. There's a well-documented, well-researched bias called the bias blind spot, which is a false belief that everyone around you has cognitive biases, except of you, except from you, because you, of course, are logical and impartial. Well, you aren't. <clears throat> I think these biases are the unintentional reason or underlying reason for most inclusion problems in open source. And in my talk today, I want to dis discuss a few of these and see how we can handle them and become more inclusive. So b before we even start, before we go into biases, step number zero in being inclusive is to have a code of conduct. <clears throat> now, this, for some reason, is a suggestion that gets a lot of pushback in many places. A lot of, a lot of times when I suggest this, I hear, well, we don't need a code of conduct. We don't need a code of conduct because everyone gets along here, right? Well, yes, but uh, <clears throat> this perception is, of course, biased as hell. First of all, it suffers from the survivor bias. So everyone still involved in this community gets along and doesn't need a code of conduct. But what about all the people who are no longer involved in the community who left because they couldn't stand it? Having a code of conduct may have prevented them from leaving. Second, one of the worst biases we all have is a bias called false consensus. Now, false consensus is a bias which makes you believe that traits, attributes, core beliefs that you have are universally common. <clears throat> so if everyone is like me, we don't need a code of conduct because I get along with myself just great, right? But everyone is not like me. People are different. Different people have different understandings of what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So more often than not, we need a code of conduct to spell these out, to say, OK, I get this is what you believe, but here is what we all agree about. And this is the acceptable way to act in our community. <clears throat> so now, now that we've passed like phase number zero, established a sensible way for all of us to interact, an agreed upon way, let's explore this false consensus bias further. Let, let's see how this false consensus bias puts up barriers that prevents our communities from being more inclusive. <coughs> Excuse me, Jack Cold. The first barrier mm, a lot of communities have is a knowledge barrier. Okay, and, and I don't mean technical knowledge, right? Think if you have a project written in, I don't know, for argument's sake, JavaScript, it's fair enough to say that if you do not know JavaScript, you'll have a hard time contributing code. So that makes sense, right? We, okay, you, you're welcome to contribute in other ways, but you'll have a hard time contributing code if you can't program in this language. Fair enough. But, but there's a world of other knowledge around this, mainly pr procedural knowledge of how do I even interact with this community? Okay, so some communities you are just asked to submit a pull request. Sometimes you need to open a JIRA ticket and have it approved and have it assigned to a specific sprint to tell you when to open this pull request. Well, having opened the pull request, what do I need to include there? <clears throat> what, what, what is the code style? Do I need to sign a contributor agreement? Uh, do I need to support x86 and ARM? I don't know. And a lot more often than not, all, all of this peripheral knowledge is undocumented, and you can't find it anywhere, because everyone knows this, right? We do this all the time. We don't need to 
describe how you send a pull request? Well, you do. You really do. Because if someone is not a member of the community, he, will, he or she will not know how to do this. And they cannot become a member of the community without knowing how to do this. So document everything. There is no such thing as being too explicit. It does not exist. The, in the worst case, you spend 10 minutes of documenting something no one will read. No big deal. It's a good, <coughs> a good sacrifice to prevent the case of, <coughs> of someone wanting to become a part of your community and not being able to, or not being able to effectively. <coughs> a second um, problem that arises from false consensus, second barrier, is a language barrier. And again, I don't mean JavaScript. I mean English. And here too, it's fair enough to say that okay, our pro project documentation, our mailing list, whatever, is in English. You have to have a working proficiency in English in order to interact with the community. That's fair enough. Or even better, we have translated our documentation, and if you wish to contribute in Spanish, English, Czech, Hebrew, whatever, here's your mailing list. But <clears throat> given a subset of the community that has agreed on a language, usually English, it's OK to assume that you need to speak this language. It's kind of by definition. But, 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 a lot of communities kind of move the bar much higher than it should be. So who, who here speaks English? <laughs> who here speaks English not as their first language? Most of us. So for people communicating in their second, third, fourth language, there's a huge difference between <clears throat> having a conversation in an asynchronous matter, in mailing lists, that you can take your time to reread everything, look up words you don't understand. If you want to write something complicated, you ask your mom to reread it because her English is better than yours. Thanks, mom. Your English is definitely better than mine. Um, <clears throat> that, that's doable. But, but then communities start taking advantage of technology, which is usually great, but these conversations start shifting from mailing lists to um, online communication, like, or immediate communication, like IRC or Discord or Slack or, I don't know, what, what are cool kids using today? Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed about me, I'm profoundly uncool, so <laughs> I have no idea. But <clears throat> for, for a non-native speaker, it's considerably harder to have a conversation in an online chat than an offline mailing list. Even worse, we have this cool new technology called telephones, which have become much, much cheaper, and all these uh, VoIP solutions. And a lot of projects are starting to have these daily, weekly, monthly calls, which <coughs> is much, much harder for not native speaker, because now I need to start worrying about can people understand my horrible accent? Can I understand everyone else's horrible accent? Do, do I get all the small jokes and uh, idioms that people use when they talk instead of writing? These, <clears throat> these are all barriers to inclusion. Because, yeah, we, we have an open call and everyone can join it, but if my English is only good enough for emails, and I have a really hard time participating in this call, which has absolutely nothing to do with my technical understanding, with my ability to flesh out a feature to suggest something and be a really useful contributor to this community. <clears throat> kind of bouncing off that, the third barrier I want to talk about is a time barrier. So this may come as a shock. Not everyone lives in the same time zone. We have several of these in the world. Not everyone uses the same work schedule. In my small team, back at Synopsys, I have people who start the day at 7 and leave the office at about 3 o'clock to pick up the kids. I have 
different people who wake up at about 12, show up to the office at about 1, and stay there till I have no idea I'm not there anymore. Yeah. And this is a really small team in the same office. When you take this globally to an open source project, people have different time zones. People have different work schedules. How many of you have ever been on a weekly call on a Friday? So thank you, everyone. I'm from Israel. Friday is not a working day for us. <laughs> a lot of Israeli companies like to schedule these talks on Sundays. <laughs> just, to, just to stick it to the man. <laughs> Horrible idea. <clears throat> but, and even if you take away these time zone and work schedule problems, different people have different abilities to devote their time, definitely to an open source project, definitely unpaid contributors. I, will, I am literally the last person who will say that fast feedback is not important. In fact, I have a whole talk about why fast feedback is important. But you need to be smart, not only fast. If you review a pull request, take, take a look and say, hmm, looks good, thank you, merged. This is great, you gave fast feedback, right? But you've excluded from this discussion anyone who isn't awake during these 10 minutes and not excessively refreshing his browser. A much better way of doing this is giving this fast feedback, but not closing up the discussion. Yeah. Hey, great, great patch. Thank you for your contribution. I am purposely not merging this. I'm going to wait till next Monday and leave the opportunity for anyone who's interested to look into this. So you've both given fast feedback, but you left the discussion open. You didn't close it up. And speaking of time and communication barriers, this kind of automatically leads to what I think is my core point. <clears throat> there is definitely when there are... Sorry, got caught up with my own sentence. I'll rephrase. As projects mature, people get to know each other better. Often they get to know each other regardless of the context of the project. More often than not, in large projects where you have commercial interest, you have people from the same company working on them, people from the same team sitting in the same room. <clears throat> How often have you seen a pull request, merge request, whatever you call it, look like this? Code, hey, I didn't understand what you did this. Bad explanation in broken English, because it's a second or third language for all of us. Two days delay. Talked to David face to face, understood his point. Thank you. Merging. What? So this is just human instinct, right? It's extremely efficient. We all want to move forward with our day job. <clears throat> but you are creating a situation here that if your name is not David, and if you don't sit in the exact same room as whatever contributor merged your code, you have absolutely no way of getting your code in. So this is very efficient, and it moves really fast in the short term, and in the long term, it's, excuse the language, bloody awful. This is the best way of creating a so-called open source community, which is closed to only include people that know me personally. Just putting your source, your source code up in GitHub does not make it open. <clears throat> so always default to open. Any communication that did not happen in this open space did not happen. <clears throat> and in, in the rare conditions that you can't, because I've seen some faces here go, yes, but we have a security consideration. Yes, but this is uh, private information for my company. <clears throat> this does happen. If it does happen and you really can't avoid it, first of all, check yourself. You usually can. But if you really can't, at least be transparent about it. At least be able to say, 
I'm explicitly not discussing this because X, Y, Z. Um, see, I'm running out of time, so I want to summarize. <clears throat> A lot of open source communities are not as inclusive as we'd want them to be. Usually, in my experience, this isn't done by, <clears throat> by malice. It's done by mistake. It's done because of unconscious biases we just can't avoid. So the good news is that if we have good intent, humans are capable of learning. And if you're presented with data, with facts, someone saying, hey, look, doing this excludes anyone who doesn't have good English, anyone who lives in a different country, whatever, we can change if we want to. Um, with that, I'll take questions if there are any. Yes. So um, I'm not sure these are like technically correct terms, but sorry. No. The, the question was, can I explain the difference between open and transparent? So um, again, I'm not sure these are technically correct terms, but what I mean, having an open discussion is really discussing everything. We are doing this because of why, in order to avoid Z, blah, blah, blah. If you can't do this, being transparent about it is about the reasoning. So we want to shift this project to do X instead of Y. This is because of a commercial interest of the company we work at. We can't go into details, but in uh, March, when, we are, when we'll have our first release, this will be made clear. So you aren't going into details, but you're at least being transparent on why you can't discuss the details. Yes? It's not about documenting everything and then the code of conduct and so on. It reminds me of society that <coughs> hopes, uh, often that uh, making more laws and uh, regulations and so on helps. It helps in certain area, but you have always sufficiently a large community of people who uh, ignore the things and uh, are rude and tell that uh, It, 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 it's too, sorry, so the question, if I can shortly rephrase it, is <clears throat> having a code of conduct and just documenting more and more doesn't always work because, <clears throat> as the question said, some people are offended by everything and not everyone really abides by the code of conduct. Right? So there's a few, a few moving parts here. First of all, Code of conduct or rules in general in any society work if there's goodwill in place. Okay? If we all join a community in an explicit, <coughs> explicit intention, excuse the language, to be assholes, it doesn't matter what code of conduct you have anywhere. If, if you really try to be obnoxious, you will succeed. Um, so it, it only works for if, if generally there is good faith. <laughs> Uh, the, the important thing about code of conduct is, first of all, being really explicit, saying, hey, look, this is how we behave here. If you are unwilling or unable to behave like this, I'm sorry, you are just unwelcome. <clears throat> and this only works where you, where you have the majority of the community kind of buying into this. It doesn't really matter the letter of the code of conduct. Okay, you don't expect anyone to say, hey, look, I read your comment here. You are in violation of Article 12, subsection 3 point D. No, nobody cares. But if, if everyone buys into this, the community will self-moderate, and, and you will have people saying, sorry, we don't do this here. Um, sorry, I'm out of time. If anyone wants to ask anything else, I'll be in the hall. Thank you for your time.